Welcome back. The Minister for Defence and Military Veterans, Nosivue Mapisa Ngakula, has once again warned that the Defence Force's ability to carry out its constitutional mandate is being diminished by budget cuts. She says their ability to equip and train the force has become increasingly difficult. Speaking during the budget vote of the Department of Defence, Mapisa Ngakula said current threats require more boots on the ground. She added, however, that this was contrary to the ceiling on personnel imposed on the Defence Force. To discuss the state of our military tonight, we're joined by Defence Analyst Helmut Heitmann. Uh, thank you for, for being with us. The, the Minister says the Defence Force has transitioned from being a mandate-driven to a funding-driven Defence Force. So presumably that means it's no longer fit for purpose and the size of the Defence Force isn't dependent on our security needs, but I guess on the, the money available. Yeah, I think I'd put it stronger than she did. I'd say it's not so much funding determinant, fund, funding constraint. Um, on, this, on the current level of funding, the Defence Force cannot begin to do what it's supposed to be able to do. Sure, you can have a Defence Force on this level of funding, but it's going to be a lot smaller and it's going to be a lot less capable and will certainly not be able to meet any regional commitments. In for, for South Africa? Yeah. I mean, you know, South Africa, it's, it's one thing people say there's no threat, but you know, people have said that before. Threats, threats uh, materialise a whole lot quicker than you can redevelop a Defence Force. It takes you at least 15 years to re redevelop a defense force, more likely 20, 25 years once you've neglected it badly. Threats can materialize in a matter of, of a couple of years, in the case of an air threat or naval threat, in a matter of months or weeks or even days. Yeah. The, and, I mean, we already have a situation next door in Mozambique, and the Army bluntly doesn't have enough infantry to handle the Mozambique deployment plus the one in the Congo plus the border. We don't have the airlift uh, to move troops around quickly. We don't have enough Roy Falk attack helicopters. We don't have the naval assets to really secure the Mozambique Channel as well as our own waters. So it's, it's we're actually much too weak. Yeah. And that, that is a problem. And, it's, you know, it's not just our borders and our waters. We need a stable region around us. If we want this economy, we are a manufacturing economy. We have to export. Potentially our most profitable export market is Africa, south of the Sahara, and certainly south of the equator. But if those countries aren't stable and becoming richer and more prosperous, they can't buy things yeah. from us. So it's, it's purely selfish self-interest for us to try and stabilize at least our region. Well, let's look at a practical example. So, so you're saying we should actually be involved in stabilizing the region. But, I mean, imagine the, the terrorists from northern Mozambique moved south. Uh, you say we could actually land up being sitting ducks. And is that what you would tell people who often argue that the, the money would be better used on uh, social services, social grants, things like that when you've got poverty in this country? Yes, I mean, even, even if it just moves a little bit south, it becomes it places at risk the Korobasa power station, the hydroelectric power station. It places at risk the gas fields from which we now draw gas. In fact, if you look longer term, we need the gas fields in Cabo Delgado as well, because the gas fields we now use are, are running down. And then bear in mind that most of our imported oil and a lot of our trade, all our trade with the Mediterranean, with the Persian Gulf, with the western seaboard of India, goes through the Mozambique Channel. If the guerrillas in Cabo Delgado follow the example of, of guerrillas in Nigeria, like the Niger Delta Avengers, or those in, in Yemen, you will start seeing maritime terrorism. You will then probably also start seeing them turn to piracy to raise money. Yeah. That's an immediate impact on our economy. Mozambique didn't ask for help. Let's just look at the, the situation there. Um, but presumably we would want to help to, to protect ourselves as well and, and the region. Then there was this task team from SADC uh, that was sent little feedback. But one of the things they were considering was if SADC, um, if the surrounding countries could actually intervene in a situation like that. So you're saying South Africa would not actually be in a position to really be extremely helpful right now. We could do some of it, but if, and if, first of all, that the, SADC, the, the force they're recommending is, is laughably too small to do the job. It, it's too small in the number of infantry involved. It has no real reconnaissance capability. It has no tactical mobility. It's, it's actually a joke in poor taste. Now, I feel terribly sorry for the people who had to draft that, because you can see the professionalism in some of their writing. They must have cringed with embarrassment. It's clearly somebody gave them a cap, a ceiling as to what they could, could talk about. What they have got in there that is useful, that is relevant, that is practical, is the naval side. But that depends entirely on the South African Navy being able to sustain the deployment of two frigates and a submarine in the, the Mozambique Channel and one of our very few remaining 1943 vintage uh, Dakota uh, Turbodac uh, maritime surveillance aircraft. Now, 
we haven't been spending money to maintain our frigates. We haven't like, given them refits. They're starting to have problems. St- things are starting to break. They don't have spares. I think only one of the three submarines is operational at the moment. So that would be difficult to do. Sure, short term, I'm sure the SANDF could do it. The Navy could do it short term, but not longer term. Yeah. I think if you look at the, that force design too, it speaks of only two attack helicopters. That's probably because they're looking to South Africa with Roy Falk, and we haven't been maintaining the fleet properly, so we probably couldn't generate more than another two. So this is where the, the budget cuts are starting to, to bite. You know, people keep saying, oh, well, they must reduce the headcount. Well, first of all, yes, there are parts of the defense force that are overstaffed and overnight, sure. But overall, the defense force is not actually big enough to do what it's supposed to be doing. It's a bit too small. Secondly, how can the defense force get rid of people if it doesn't have money to pay them severance packages? Yeah. You can't just toss them in the street. That wouldn't be moral, and it's come to think it wouldn't be legal in terms of labor law either. So it's all very well for people to tell the, the minister of defense and the chief of defense force, you know, reduce yeah. your headcount. But you don't have money for severance pay, they can't do it. Yeah, and, and so she, she was out. saying they, they actually need more uh, headcount. We have to leave it there, but thank you very much for that analysis. Uh, not encouraging on a security front uh, for South Africa, uh, but that was Defence Analyst Talmud Teichmann.